for me, for the company or anything. Uh, ethic and moral comes first. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to episode 240 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host, and today I'm joined by Mr. Jordi Delage, a martial arts practitioner who took the huge life step of moving to Japan. Here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you amazing interviews and wonderful topic-driven episodes two times every week, and we thank you for tuning in. If you haven't checked out the things that we make at Whistlekick, you can go to whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes for this or any of the other episodes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Those are the places to go. You can sign up for our newsletter at either one of those sites, and you're also going to find links to the other things that we do on the web to support the martial arts, the thing that you love, the thing that I love, the thing that so many of us owe so much to. Our guest today is a martial arts practitioner from France who chose to give it all up and move to Japan. Mr. Jordi Delage, an Aikido practitioner, experienced a few, let's say, unpleasant experiences growing up. And it was these experiences that had a tremendous impact on who he grew to be and how he sees the world. Mr. Delage is also the founder of Sato Shop, an online Japanese retailer dedicated to Aikido practitioners and enthusiasts. We're lucky to have him because he not only tells us about his history, his childhood, his path on the martial arts, but he gives us an inside look of what it looks like to live, work, and train in Japan. Let's welcome him. Mr. Delage, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Nice to meet you, Jeremy. Um, looking forward for your questions. I'm looking forward to answer, you're hearing your answers to the questions. And let's, let's start off quickly. I know we're going to talk about how all of this happened, but it's no secret that most of our listeners are American, uh, even though I, I think last check we're up to like 133 countries people are listening to us. And, but you have an accent that makes it pretty clear you are not from the United States. So... Where where are you coming from, and where is your accent from? Well, I'm from France, so um, some people may think um, I'm just another French guy with a terrible English accent. <laughs> and some people, mainly girls, even from the U.S., think it's cute, so I'm going to keep it. <laughs> I love that. But you're not actually in France right now, are you? No, I'm in Japan, and um, actually, I've learned most of my English and my accent as well uh, in Japan. So it's kind of ironic because I've learned Japanese language before. Um, I've learned English at school, like everyone, but I started speaking decent English um, after Japanese language. So it's kind of my third language. My second one would be Japanese. Wow. Okay. And so for anyone out there that might, might feel a little critical and say, you know, I'm having, having a hard time hearing him, just kind of relax, listen in. I mean, we've been chatting for 15 minutes prior to the interview and, and I'm having no problems. And just remember, most of us speak English reasonably well. And, and here we have a guest with at least three languages. So... That always impresses me. I, I, I struggle with a little bit of Spanish, but I'm certainly not fluent and certainly don't speak three languages. Of course, we're not here to talk about language or geography or anything like that. We're here to talk about martial arts. And I know we're going to talk about how at some point we're going to talk about how you got from France to Japan and, and why and all of that. But let's roll all the way back. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, um, oh, let's forget about a few years of judo uh, when being just a small kid. Uh, you know, like, I don't know in the U.S., but in France, like, I don't know, 30% of kids do some judo, um, like when you're five, six, seven, eight. Uh, but I seriously started um, with Aikido uh, for quite a futile reason. It was for a girl. Uh, ironically, I ended up practicing with her only a few times before she stopped, and uh, I continued. 
So yeah, it's kind of futile reason. Um, <clears throat> at the time, uh, I, I didn't know about the different Aikido styles or anything. So they were just practicing one of the closest dojo from home. Uh, it's in France. Uh, it's a tour. It's a very small city, very small. I mean, when you live in the US, you have big and small, uh, but it's fairly small. It's um, and I was living in the countryside, like 20, 30 kilometers from the city. So I had to do like, um, I don't know, 30 minutes of bike to, to get there. And um, it was with very, um, it was very small dojo. It was like countryside martial art practice, but with a very nice guy. So you started for for a girl. This, how old were you? I was uh, fifteen, and she was eighteen. How foolish oh. I was! Oh, okay, okay. So older women, <laughs> and certainly, I don't. I don't think the idea of doing something maybe a little bit out of our comfort zone is is foreign to anyone listening when it comes to love. Here you are. You you you've done some judo, and it sounded like you've st- you stopped for a few years, but decided you would try Aikido because of this girl. But then she stopped. What was it that you discovered so quickly in Aikido that kept you around? Actually, um, she she was three years older than me. And uh, obviously I was 15, she was 18. She was a bit stronger physically than me. But uh, at at a body, she just put me down in a very uh, gently manner. And I thought, what the hell? Why? And I just asked her uh, why the why she could do that, and she she just told me Aikido, and she's been practicing for like uh, I don't know seven eight years, something like that. And wasn't it fun? I liked the girl, so uh, I, I went there and I discovered more or less what she what she had done to me. Um, well, later on, I discovered that um, you cannot really apply a control technique that easily on someone. Uh, the only reason that it worked at the time was because we were playing and I was not attempting to really punch her. But um, the idea of um, practicing a martial art that is only dedicated to um I wouldn't say self-defense because it's not what it is, but um, protecting yourself and others in various different different ways that include um, psychology, not only, you know, physical techniques. So it was a wall. It was uh, learning how to um, analyze situation better, um, having better um, physical relationship with people, um, what, what we call awase in, in Japanese, which is like um, harmonizing with people. Um, I, I found that uh, it was more useful in my life at the time uh, to learn how to get along better with other people that I did like than trying to learn to fight or self-defense or anything. So basically, it was just improving my everyday life. And I was a difficult kid. So I think Aikido just gave me some tools, uh, kind of framework to uh, uh, improve the way I was uh, interacting with people. And pretty quickly, my life did improve. And that's the reason why I, I just stayed and continued practicing. I don't know about everyone listening, but I'm going to guess that most of our listeners are older than 15. We've all been 15, and I can't speak for everyone, but I know that when I was 15, I didn't have a terrible amount of self-awareness, but that's what you're talking about, that you very quickly realized Aikido was making you a better person. So I find that interesting that you were a difficult, 
child, you you had some some needs, and if you want, we can talk about what what that was when you say you were a difficult child. But then martial arts quickly, it sounds like, dragged you out of that and made you a better person. That's not a a story that I think a lot of us have. So, um, yes, I, I think that um, when you're a teenager, um, you you can have a good or bad environment. Um, but it's very hard to compare between each other because it's all about how you um how you feel about what you have and um what was really um amazing with my aikido practice that my teacher uh was uh, a really good guy really he he was um a teacher an english teacher uh in a difficult school with um with a lot of troubled kids and he had this way to um uh challenge his students and give them what they need and, and giving to a student what he needs uh, at a specific uh, moment in time is um, it's more than only martial arts. So I want to believe that he acquired that through Aikido and, um, and he was trying to pass that to, to his students. Um, I was young, so he was more in the process to um, solving myself, saving me than actually uh, trying to teach me how to help others. But um, that's what I felt with, uh, with this teacher. So I, I really think that um, whatever the martial art you practice, um, the teacher, what he can give you at a specific moment in time is the, the most important thing. And that's what made me stay um, at the dojo. Because um, uh, I knew I was in good hands uh, with someone not trying to sell me any strange things, strange techniques or, or self-defense or anything. It was just giving me what I needed as a, as a human being at the time. I know we have a lot of martial arts instructors out there and they're likely nodding their head as they're listening to this. I had a school. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to to teach a lot of younger folk, but I think that becomes a big part of the job, identifying people that need what you can offer even outside the martial arts. And we've had quite a few guests on the show who have told some interesting stories around that. What do you think? Well, I have... think... Go... No, go ahead. Yeah, well, well I think it's, it's very um, <clears throat> interesting in my case because... Uh, I, I never, um, I, I thought about teaching for, for a few months, few years, but um, um, I, I thought I wouldn't be a good teacher. So I, I decided not to uh, go into that path. But I became um, a manager because I created a company and I, I have people I have to deal with on an everyday basis. And I, I realized that I had to do the same thing with uh, the people that I, I manage every day. And at that point, I just realized, yeah, maybe I was a bit foolish not wanting to uh, teach. Because at some point in life, you, you get older and you, or you have kids and you have to teach them something. So yeah, uh, you, you can't avoid teaching forever. Mm, that's a great point. And of course, employees are, are at times students that you can't discipline in the same way that you can in martial arts. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a lot more difficult with um, with grown up people than with kids, or, or or even I think more difficult than in martial arts because in martial arts they're here to learn something. They want you to teach them something. Uh, when they're working for you or with you, they don't really want you to teach them things. They just want you to manage them in the nicest way possible. But if you're a good manager, uh, I think what your purpose should be is to help them, help them grow. Uh, even if they're 25, 30, 35, 40, uh, we, we learn all the time and we can always get better. So um, it gets more difficult with older people. 
but uh, it's kind of a very interesting challenge. Mm, certainly. That gives us some context for who you are. And as we move forward, I know we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about the company that you founded that you've already mentioned. Or I'm sure we're going to talk about how you made it from France to Japan. And there will be some good stories in there. What's your favorite martial arts story from your time training? <clears throat> well, um, I know people who listen that kind of uh, question expects um, a rather funny and, I don't know, something they can dream about. Uh, I'm not sure I have any of that in in my own um, history, but I have one or two stories that uh, had a major impact on me. Um, the first one, um, it was not about fighting. It was about controlling the situation and um, uh, but not fighting for my for myself because my teacher did fight, but uh, uh, not my teacher, a teacher that I knew. Um, so I was with this teacher, rather strong guy, and some Rosneck guys were obviously looking for trouble, was in the parking lot. And um, I think he felt it uh, at the exact time he saw them. He just felt that something was just off. And he moved toward them and he put one of them down straight forward without saying anything, without any warning. I was like, whoa, we're doing Aikido, guy. We don't just put down people like that. And what what's happening? And he just later said that um, dealing with any kind of situation is a matter of psychology and getting that right is the key to not only win uh, like a futile fight like that, but also to implement a martial art philosophy in the everyday life. So at the, the time, the point was the the guy he put down was the alpha male of the, the group of three guys. And taking him down first and fast just made, made the two other uh, run away immediately. And I thought, that's not what I want to do because I don't really like fighting. But uh, if you just transcript that to an everyday life situation uh, where you have a group of people that is bothering you at work or anything, uh, taking the leader down first and fast might be the best way to save the two others. So it was kind of... A, really, uh, it had a huge impact on me and changed the way uh, I see martial arts. Mm -hmm. If you're on the second one, short one as well, um, <clears throat> it was about the first time I think I stood up against a man. Uh, he was trying to touch a woman in the train. So it, it's, it was in Japan. So the risk was minimal. People can't fight. Now, this is Japan. It's a very safe country. <clears throat> You're 100% sure the guy has no weapons, nothing on him. Oh, it wasn't about that. Um, but, you know, Japan is a very rigid society, and everyone minds his own business. And as a foreigner, I'm expected to behave the same way. So I did it for years. Like, like was, I don't know, at the time, seven, eight years in Japan. And... Um, I don't know, at that time, I felt that doing the right thing is more important than doing anything else. And I just stood up and pushed the guy out of the train and tried to help the, the girl to realize that uh, it would be better if she just could act on, on herself, not counting on other people. Because in, Jap in Japan, it's not going to happen. No one is going to help. And... The risk I had at the time was about my visa or um, uh, being able to stay in Japan. And, and because when you're a foreigner here, you, you have just to behave and be sure you don't get into any kind of trouble. Or it wasn't physically, um, 
any danger. But um, I don't know. From that day, I started to act on this principle um, every day on every aspect of my life, no matter what people think or no matter what the risk uh, for me, for the company or anything, uh, ethic and moral comes first. And I think it took me far longer than it should have uh, because it's very, it's a very, very important principle in life. Mm. But that, that, that's very sh- short stories that are not very uh, funny or significant. But um, I think that's, that's kind of uh, small stories that um, push people to evolve. So rather than talking about something um, extraordinary, uh, I think people listening to the show um, should just hang on to their uh, own um, little experience and get something out of it. That's the most important thing. The story of you pushing the man out of the train as he was trying to assault the woman. It sounds like yeah. it was a, a pretty simple confrontation. It doesn't sound like he fought back or anything. It, it would just, you just kind of took him and moved him off the train and the doors shut. And No, was... I think I scared, I scared the hell out of him when okay. I pushed him. Because in Japan, it, it just doesn't happen. Uh, you, you don't react, you don't act, you don't, you don't, you just mind your own business. And, and actually I think people in the train watching the scene at the time were probably as surprised as, as the guy I pushed. So it was, yeah, you really need to have this, uh, experience of living in Japan, uh, for at least a few months to, to understand what it means to really, um, do something against the the Japanese very rigid society. What was the woman's response afterwards? She was sorry, which is just crazy because she she, she did nothing wrong. But uh, yes, yeah, she was sorry that that she had to have someone to help her. I, I don't know exactly, actually. I, that's probably one of the things I would I could never understand from the Japanese culture is the, uh, all, all these Japanese people who are sorry for things they're absolutely not responsible about. Um, unfortunately, I really think that the woman would be in the same situation again, and it will very likely happen. She would do nothing. Because that where I failed at the, at the time, I should have stayed a little and talked with her and tried to uh, make her understand that she has to protect herself or do something. Maybe it could have helped. I don't know. But um, yeah, just pushing the guy out of the train was not not really meaningful for for the girl. I, I don't think I uh, the the guy probably just forgot about it. The next day was very likely drunk, and I don't think I did anything good for for any of them, nor the guy or the girl. But uh, for myself, it was kind of a um, revelation, maybe in some ways, uh, just. I, I did change the way um, I, I see the the society um, rigidity or pressure you can feel every day, and I thought that it's you have to behave, of course, but um, the most important thing is to do what you think is right. So that's pretty much all I got from that experience. Mm. I agree. Do what, do what you think is right. Obviously, martial arts is a big part of your life. I don't think anybody's come on the show who can't say that martial arts is a large part of their life. Outside of martial arts, though, are there things you're passionate about? Do you have hobbies or 
activities that you enjoy? Well, um, somehow I think that everything that I do, or almost everything, is more or less tied to martial arts in some ways. Um, I'm doing video editing and, and directing, publishing on YouTube about Japanese craftsmanship, interviews. Um, I'm also trying to help uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, people doing research about Japanese traditional martial arts, so it can be translations from Japanese or ancient Japanese. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty much all linked to martial arts. So I like diving. I do. I got my license a, a year or two ago. Um, I like skydiving. I'm thinking about taking a, a license to jump alone on my own. But uh, apart from that, yeah, I think pretty much everything I do is linked to martial arts. I like really website. Um, <clears throat> in my company, I'm doing half uh, management, of course, and half uh, website development, uh, designing and stuff like that. I do like that very much. Um, video editing and interviews and meeting people and try to make them say things they wouldn't say in in a different situation because you know japanese teachers and martial arts people they're pretty old so if you want them to tell you something significant you have to push them a little and, and it's important to do it before they die at some point because they're all very old and yeah, that, that's kind of Human relationship with uh, martial artists and teachers is also something I, I, I do like very much. And that could be completely unrelated to martial arts because it's about human, um, just being human, you know, talking to people and, and trying to get along with them. But uh, in my case, somehow, it all comes from, uh, from martial arts, except for diving and skydiving, <laughs> which are the two things I'm doing that have absolutely no relation with martial arts. Um, even though I think that um, trying to do some techniques in the water is funny, <laughs> as well as trying to do some techniques in the air when you're skydiving is funny as well. But I wouldn't skydive with an Aikido gears and everything because it's too dangerous. <laughs> right. I'm sure there's something that we, if, if we spent enough time, we could dig in and find the similarities in your mindset while you're underwater or falling from the sky versus when you're in the dojo. I bet there's yeah, some... Uh, uh, there are some connections, oh, yeah. of course, yeah. Um, you have to be calm and challenge yourself and everything, and that's something you, you do in martial arts. But n not only, I mean, a any people practicing a, a sport um, at some level, I mean, with uh, commitment, uh, we'll have, in a way or another, uh, the same kind of thoughts we have in martial arts. The only difference between sports and martial arts in human evolution is that uh, in martial arts, we're trying to teach that. In sports, at some level, people just realize it, but it's not not something that starts within the, the sports training. You've mentioned your company a few times, and rather than wait for the end because it's such an important part of your life, let's talk about it now. You founded a company at, at some point when you got to <clears throat> Japan, so tell us a bit about that and how that's impacted your life and your martial arts training. Well, um, after... Five years in Japan, uh, two of them were half in France and Japan uh, doing uh, a bachelor degree. Um, I, I, so I spent one year in, in Japan, two years in France and Japan, and then about two years in Japan. And I realized that I wouldn't find a job uh, that I could get along with. And I wanted to do something that I like because until I started searching for a job, I was just uh, practicing martial arts or going to university. And when going to 
the university I was doing a lot of martial arts. So I wanted to do something I like, couldn't find anything interesting in Japan. And I thought that uh, uh, that's something my father used to say. And um, he has no link whatsoever with martial arts, but he did say a few very uh, insightful things to me the few times uh, I spent with him, uh, which is, if you don't find a job, then create your job. I think that's something that American people can understand uh, very easily because it's, it, it's the U.S. culture. It's not really in the European or French culture, nor, nor it's in the Japanese culture either. And um, yeah, I thought, okay, I do website development because I like that. And uh, I'm practicing martial arts. I have friends asking for uh, Aikido equipment made in Japan all the time, and I'm doing that for free. So let's group that together and create a company selling martial arts equipment uh, online with a nice website, and make a little money so I can just make a decent living and, uh, and continue practicing uh, as much as I want. Turned out that... Um, it was a lot more successful than I expected. Uh, so many things happened. It was kind of crazy because uh, 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 it's not that I don't want to, but I really can't give any name. But the, the, this martial art business in Japan, martial art equipment business in Japan is not very honest. Um, they all talk about martial art values and, and everything, but. 99% of the shops here at, or brands are um, run by people who don't practice. So they don't really have any strong connection with martial arts. And uh, they import from China, Pakistan, many things. Sometimes they just sell it's made in Japan when it has just been a little transformed in Japan. I realized that I started meeting um, craftsmen in Japan. Uh, just very simple guys, one, two, three guys in a small workshop. Uh, trying to make a living, uh, usually old guys in the middle of nowhere. And I thought, yeah, I want to support those guys. That that I want to work with those craftsmen who spent their life um, polishing the art and trying to sell the the, the products um, with absolutely no idea whatsoever of how to sell stuff. That they can make, they cannot sell. And they were being manipulated, I think, uh, by many companies, uh, not increasing prices for like 20 years, 30 years, um, because, yeah, you know, it's difficult and we have to keep our prices low and everything. No, I, I want to work with you. You set your prices. I don't care the price. I just want good stuff and and good a good relationship with you. I want your products to be introduced uh, in the proper way uh, to Westerners. And, um, and my company swift from uh, a retailer of other brands to our own brand, uh, which is, I think, I'm not sure about it because I don't know all Japanese brands. There's a lot. But as far as I know, I think we're the only brand with only 100% many Japan equipment. So the point is not to make money or sell a lot of stuff, quantities or anything. It's really working with craftsmen and doing things right and everything. And that part of the job um, took me a lot more time that, than I would have liked at the time. So I'm not practicing as much as I used to. And, um, but I, I think I'm still being useful uh, for the, the martial art uh, community. I hope so. And I feel like, at least what the, that's what they say to me, uh, that I'm useful to the craftsmen who found another way, a new way to deal with businesses. Um, not being just the production line of another brand, but valued, being valued themselves by, by, by the brand who present them, introduce them, 
and I felt, humanly speaking, that felt really good. So I'd like to practice more, but I also don't want to uh, let down the the craftsman I'm working with. What you 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 talked about the importing from China. You talked about the other things, the, these actions that companies selling martial arts equipment that are owned by folks that don't train in the martial arts, the disconnect there. And it's something that maybe this isn't going to resonate as strongly for everyone listening, but it does for me, because as we already talked about, you and I are pretty similar. We started martial arts companies as an effort to support the arts and, and further our ability to, as you said, train when you want. Um, of course, I don't know about yeah, you. Yeah, it's yeah. not quite whenever I want this, this thing got a little bit bigger, uh, a little bit faster than I would have expected. You, you mentioned the same. Why yeah, is... I get the question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I get the question. Actually, I, I don't think that made in China is a bad thing. Uh, what's what's bad is uh, when you import from China, modify your product just a little bit and say it's made in Japan. That's a problem. And the the question here is, um, do you inform your customers of what they are buying correctly without lying to them? And if so, do you practice the right prices and everything? And that's... uh, we live in a world with internet and everything where you can always find customers. So you, you can do whatever you want as far as you have a, a decent price, cost performance, uh, you you can sell your stuff. I don't think it's enough. Um, and there are plenty of ways to repay uh, your customers, like doing what you do, actually, with this podcast. It's a very good way to repay your customers because you're you're using your uh, um, your company to produce and valuable content for practitioners. Uh, on my end, as a foreigner living in Japan, uh, it was kind of it, it came naturally to me that uh, supporting Japanese craftsmen and introduce them to foreigners, Westerners ma- mainly in English and French, uh, was it's not like um, it was the right thing to do, is that it was the only thing I could do. I'm a foreigner in Japan. I speak French, a bit of English, and I, I speak Japanese, of course, and I, I, I see those guys and meet them, go to the, the, the bar, uh, drink together, very, very nice craftsmen. Uh, the only thing I can do, um, that feels right is to introduce them correctly. The only thing I wouldn't do uh, and I really cannot uh, support is uh, Pakistan or in India or Vietnam made stuff uh, because of child labor. And I, I'm probably against uh, child labor. So even if you do work with people who say they don't use childs, you never know in those countries and regulations are really too soft. Mm. Uh, So that's something I I, I can't work with. But I have have absolutely absolutely no issues with with Made in China. I work with some companies uh, importing from China to sell in Japan uh, in very, very good conditions. So I just can't do it because I'm a French guy in Japan and importing stuff from China and reselling them to Westerners would be not very honest from a foreigner living in Japan. I don't see. If, I don't know if you see the idea. I, I certainly do. I certainly do. And and what I'm hearing is uh, a sense of, of of stewardship. I don't know if that that word's going to come through. The idea that you you are responsible in a, in a sense for what's happening for these products for the customers that are buying them. And for their love of the martial arts, for the folks that are making these craftsmen in Japan that are making these products, you have an opportunity to help everyone and a sense of responsibility because of that. That's what I'm hearing. And that's something that I I feel as well. So I'm enjoying 
hearing that from someone else. Yeah, you know, actually, um, I think that's a, that's a feeling. That's something that is more um, alive in the U.S. than in Europe. Um, I, I've seen what happened after the uh, <clears throat> typhoons who came to the U.S. Uh, a few days, a few weeks back, and people helping each other and everything. And we don't see that that much in France or in Japan either. Um, I mean, the Fukushima disaster was a very good example of that. But people are not really helping each other because they don't feel any responsibility about others. That's kind of something people think that Japan works that way, but it doesn't. Uh, the truth is that if Japanese act how they act and you feel like they're really working together and helping each other, it's just because of the, the society who pushed pushes them to do that but it's not from the heart and i don't know i, I i've seen pretty amazing things uh recently on the news and i thought that um that's something that should ring or touch the heart of most practitioners especially japanese or chinese martial arts with the, this kind of confucian values and everything that uh, you have a responsibility at different levels um, in your own community, uh, for the people uh, in your dojo, if you're a teacher, to the people you, to your students. And for me, as a, as a foreigner in Japan, um, of course, I want Japan to acknowledge me and, and accept who I am, which is probably not going to happen anytime soon. But... Uh, I also feel that I have a responsibility. I choose Japan. I live here. I, I could just leave. If, if I'm not happy, I just leave. I'm critical about Japan, of course, but uh, for their own good, uh, I'm trying to help them, not to, to just criticize for, for, for nothing, just for fun. It, it's, my responsibility here is um, Japan has good things to offer. France has good things to offer. Um, Westerners have good, good things to offer, and um, there are things Japanese do better than we do, and the opposite is true as well. We do things better than Japanese to some extent. So our duty as foreigners in Japan is to somehow, because it's difficult, but push Japanese people to think about what we do better than them and try to um, have them implement some of the things we do better in the West. And I think at the opposite, if you're a Japanese in the US or in Europe, you have to do the, the exact same thing and try to push the good of what your culture ha has to offer. I always see this, the bright side of things, you know. Mm, absolutely. We'll talk a little bit more later on about your company and, and if people are interested in checking out your products, you know, we, we've got some time blocked off at the end for that. But of course, I, I do want to remind folks, because this comes up once in a while, at no point do we ever have guests on who pay to be here. There's never a kickback. Whenever a guest, you know, benefits in some financial way from our listeners supporting them, not one nickel ever has or ever will come back to whistle kick and that that's that's incredibly important to me just to be objective and transparent about that yeah actually i'm keeping the name of the company for the end of the interview perfect so if they want to check it they have to listen to the end they have to listen to the whole thing that's right <laughs> yeah good good all right let's 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 move on i i think we've got an even better picture of who you are now we heard some stories and i want i'm, I'm going to ask you for another one now one of the things that's common amongst martial artists is our ability to persevere through difficult times. I'd like you to tell us now about a challenge, some difficult part of your life and how you were able to use or reflect on your martial arts training to get through it. Well, I think that's kind of the opposite that happens. Um, what happened is that uh, the difficulties I had in Japan, 
um, kind of undermined my martial art practice. And um, I'm not very proud of that, but that's what happened. So um, I just can't deny it. The, the fact is that um, when you live long enough in Japan, you realize that you will never be accepted uh, as a Japanese people, even if you speak perfect Japanese. I mean, I, I, I get the phone, I call someone, I call for a pizza, or, and then no one realizes I'm not Japanese on the phone. But uh, when you meet people face to face, then you just cannot hide it. And that's something that just took me down for a, a few months, maybe a year or two. Uh, until I met, I, I met a wonderful guy, uh, Alexander Bennett, which is a seventh dan kendo teacher from New Zealand, uh, teaching at Kandai University. Uh, an amazing guy, but the best Japanese I ever heard, and, and incredible martial artist. Um, I did an interview about him because I wanted people to hear what he has to say about living in Japan, actually. And yeah, he made me realize, and it was not that long ago, a few months, that um, I don't feel good in Japan. I, I don't feel at the right place, but it's not the fault of Japan. It's not because of Japan. It's because of me. It's my fault. It's because I'm not taking the things the way I should. And I always had this way of seeing things, but I couldn't apply it to myself. And it made me realize that. That's, and at the time, you know, I, I'm in a, in a business uh, where our products are Aikikai approved. Aikikai is the main uh, Aikido organization in the world. Uh, I'm training at the Hombu Dojo, the, the world headquarter of the Aikikai. So I basically meet all the most important teachers in the world on a daily basis. And I have this uh, business related approval from them. So when a competitor complains, he just called the Aikikai and complained about me. Not even about the company, but me. And at some point, I got in trouble with a few teachers, and especially one, my own teacher, on the mats after class. I was like, no, I'm, I'm here to help the community. I'm not he here to, to make any trouble. I think he did a mistake at the time because he didn't hear all the, the points before coming to me. And um, in his own way, he did apologize a bit later. Uh, but at the time, it was like, I don't want to practice. I don't want to be on the mass if I cannot. Um, I wasn't in the mood of improving myself. I was kind of fighting. Um, I, I wasn't in the good um, mindset for practice. So I did stop, almost stop for a while. I did. I, I went to Kyoto, practice with other teachers, and it took me a while to recover from from that. And it's actually it rings a bell with the the, the story I, I told before, because. Um, when I started to do the right thing, in my own opinion, and no matter the cost, it did cost a lot, actually. Uh, it cost for my business, but it also cost for my practice and personally. Um, Japanese is a complicated country with a very rigid society. And, and when you are in close, I mean, very close to the top of your uh, your martial arts school uh, is through Aikido. It's even more difficult with Koryu or the school like Katori Shintoryu or school like that. You just get evicted and, and you can't come back. In Aikido, it's, it's a little easier. But still, uh, I don't know if it's because I'm not Japanese. Probably Japanese people would have handled it a better way. But I didn't. So 
I, I don't think that's martial art practice who uh, helped me get through this. It's uh, my meetings and the interview I did with Alexander Bennett and a few other people I met at the time. Um, I, I got help from other martial artists in Japan, foreigners, who went through the same thing before me. I'm kind of um, glad and, and happy that um, it's part of martial art, even if we don't practice the same thing. Alex Bennett is the, the kendoka, I'm doing Aikido. But at some point, we all face the same difficulties and we help each other. And I think that's that's really very important. So I, I cannot say it's really martial art that helped me through this because it wasn't through practice on the mats, but it's still martial arts because the people who helped me uh, somehow did it because of martial arts. Now it's a bit complicated to explain, but I think martial arts is a framework. You, you put whatever you want into it. And the, the way of um, um, meeting different people with the same framework, with, but with different things attached to it, uh, is a very good way to uh, improve yourself. I think that was very clear, the way you explained it. If I was to ask you who the most influential person on your martial arts has been, who would that be? Well, um, that would be very difficult. I think my first teacher, as I mentioned it at the beginning, was the most influential people because it just saved me. Um, uh, I don't think I would have continued practicing martial arts without him. And I don't think that I would um, have taken the right path without him. But that was a long time ago. And um, since that time, I met a few people who were really significant to me. Um, some people that I admire, uh, like Alexander Burnett, as I mentioned before, uh, for what they did and what they still do in Japan. And I know they went through a very difficult time. And then uh, I admire how they, they got over that. But um, I think if there is one person for the last 10 years who really did influence me, uh, it's Guillaume Hera. It's another French guy, sorry, in Japan. <laughs> is practicing Aikido at the Aikai Hombu Dojo and Daitoryu in Shikoku, an old martial art, uh, which is the ancestor of Aikido. It has meaning. And he, he's, um, he has a, a scientific educational background. Uh, he is PhD in biology or something, but I, I can't really pinpoint very, because it's very technical. Um, I also have a scientific background, but uh, not to that extent. And he is a very challenging person. Um, if he disagrees with you, you're going to know it painfully. Because he has this way to be so much better than you at explaining that you're wrong, that at the end of the discussion, you think you're wrong even if you're right. But uh, it, it's it's very challenging. Um, we don't agree on everything, of course, uh, and that for the best. I think I probably managed to bend his opinions on a few things. I hope so, because it did change mine and many things. And um, yeah, having someone... Um, Playing ping pong with you, uh, tennis, uh, t table tennis. I know we, we say ping pong in <laughs> France. Uh, just you, you just throw the, the ball and you send it back, and, and you can have this play together, 
when you're shooting something, you get it back and you're shooting it again. And and I think if you're a martial artist or if you're not, whatever you do in your life, you need someone at some point that is able to um, answer your inquiries, answer your questions, answer your uh, everything you're sure about. You, you, you expose your point, you tell your point, you're sure about it, and you have someone in front of you, you can just destroy your whole reasoning. You need that. It's very healthy. Um, I think for this reason alone, uh, Guillaume Herard has been the the most influential people of the last 10 years in my life because it destroyed my reasoning so many times that I had to get better and better and better to keep up with myself. That's very important. Mm. And of course, I didn't put you up to this as consistent listeners to the show will know just a few weeks ago, we had Sensei Arard on the show and it was from the same listener that suggested the two of them. Obviously they know each other. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't, I didn't know that until just uh, a bit before I started interviewing Sensei Arard. Um, I'm not sure what episode number that was yet. Cause it hasn't come out yet as we're recording this, but, um, it's always fun when those yeah, things I didn't know, overlap. I, I didn't know either. I just learned that <laughs> a, a few days ago. So I was pretty surprised because um, I, I was thinking about this interview uh, and that kind of answer before he even told me that he was on the show. So I thought about changing my answer, uh, but that wouldn't be fair because it's pretty what I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's so perfectly honestly. Um, that's the truth. Guillaume did help me and change me a lot. And I, I have the weakness. Um, I want to believe that I did change him a little bit as well. <laughs> I, I want to believe that because if not, uh, it's kind of one way and I would have to repay him so much. I, I, I don't want to believe that. Well, after listening to you thus far and, and reflecting on my conversation with him, I can't imagine that you haven't had an impact on him as well. When I think about any teacher-student relationship, of course, the students receive a lot from the teacher, but the best teachers always seem to receive a lot from the students as well. I know I did when I had my school. I know that I still do when I have the opportunity to teach others. If you had the opportunity to train with anyone, anyone in the world, any style, anywhere in time, they can be alive or dead, who would you want to train with? That, that's a funny question. Um, I think that any Aikidoist, I don't know if there are Aikidoists listening, but any Aikidoist would expect me to say uh, Moriye Ueshiba, founder of Aikido. But I'm not going to say that uh, for one very simple reason. Um, apart from the fact it wouldn't be very interesting. Uh, it's because Aikido has evolved a lot since uh, the passing of the founder. And I think there are plenty of amazing Aikidoists around the world, uh, bad ones, but mostly good ones. And I don't know, I'm very happy with the Aikido I do today. So I don't know, not really the Aikido founder. I wouldn't get that much from him, I think. So I, I think I would say Kyuzo Mifune, the, the judo uh, Kyujin, uh, amazing teacher, one of uh, the founder students, uh, Kano Jigoro. And I think, I can't be sure of that, but I really think he was better, technically speaking, than the founder. Uh, if you want to know why I think that, then you can watch Alexander Bennett's interview on my YouTube channel because he says exactly why I think that. Uh, Jigoro Kano was an amazing um, teacher and he has amazing skills, but he wasn't that much of an amazing uh, technician. Kyuzo Mifune was a wonderful technician. Uh, the few videos we have of him moving like a cat 
uh, it was unique in judo history. We never ever saw that after Michonne. And um, I would have loved training with such a magician. Because I really think that judo is not so far from Aikido. Um, it, it's really about uh, controlling your opponent center and uh, and while having contact with him, uh, move the best way possible to control the situation 100%. And one of the very rare teacher or people I, I saw doing that was Kyuzo Mifune. So, um, no matter if it's not Aikido, uh, training with such a magi magician, because I really think it's, it's like magic, uh, would have been wonderful. Unfortunately, Kizu Mifune is not with us anymore, so it's not going to happen. I know whenever we talk to folks who practice Aikido, the subject of competition takes a slightly different turn than when we talk to someone from karate or taekwondo. Yeah. But for consistency, I like to ask the question, um, have you ever competed? What are, what are your thoughts on competition? So as you know, uh, no competition in Aikido. Uh, or I must say, at least not in my style or, or any major styles, but there are a few minor styles doing competition uh, in different ways. Sometimes it's only kata, sometimes it's also... Um, sparring a little bit, but not myself. I did one year of judo at university after having like six, seven years uh, background in Aikido, including one year at the uh, world headquarters in Japan. And I think I won 100% of the, of the Shi'ai. I probably won everything. But that wasn't fair. I had an extensive background in Aikido. All of the guys were just beginners. It was so easy that it was just completely stupid. And that's probably the reason I stopped doing judo. I wasn't interested at all in the competition orientation of the art. It was like, you're starting judo, you have some Aikido background, you win all your, your, your chi against judoka because, because it's how it is. And they can't even put you in a higher category because there are rules and you're a beginner. You, you, ha you don't have even even a yellow belt. It was like white belt. And I had a few green belts or blue belts uh, on my Shi'ai and was winning anyway. But it was, of course, I would have lost in seconds with, uh, with black belt judoka. But, uh, uh, that was kind of disappointing because I was expecting judo to bring me something more and it was all about competition, but I stopped. That's my only experience with competition, <laughs> apart from the, the company because uh, business is kind of a competition, but uh, that's uh, a whole another story. It, it certainly is competition, isn't it? What were you hoping to gain from your time in judo other than competition? You, you certainly knew something about judo because you've done it as a child. So to go back to it, you must have had some hopes or expectations. Yeah. So honestly, I did stop Aikido for the two years I was in, in at university in France. Um, I, I did stop because I, I spent a few months at, um, he's going to hate me because he's a friend, so he's going to hate me, uh, Christian TCS Dojo. Christian Tissi is one of the most uh, important, famous Aikido teachers in the world. And um, the French guy as well. Sorry again. And um, he, his daughter is very demanding and the atmosphere there wasn't for me. So I did a few weeks there and then didn't feel right. So uh, I could have just picked another dojo and it was in Paris, so we, we have plenty of amazing teachers. But I thought, yeah, I'm at university studying Japanese. Um, we have judo classes, kendo classes, and why not? So I did judo and kendo for two years. And um, I avoided uh, kendo competitions. And I think I, I haven't done any competition in kendo, not, not even one. Uh, but I did in, in judo. Um, well, I... 
I think that in Aikido, we have a tendency to be too soft, uh, too light, too soft, uh, taking ukemi, falling too easily. Uh, that's a problem when you don't practice competition. At some point, you you just get used to jump by yourself, take ukemi, and then say, oh, yeah, your technique was good. And if you have a bit of ego, you just block the opponent. And and, and since you know what he's going to do before he, he does it, you can block whatever he does anyway. It doesn't mean anything. But that's something that happened in Aikido. So judo was a good idea for that because uh, in competition and not even competition, when you, you're training, uh, your partner, he, he never knows what you're going to do. And put things in perspective. Um, help me uh, f- probably feel a bit heavier physically in my Aikido practice. And not do foolish things like blocking for nothing or, uh, or using my ego too much because I know, know that if I were in a judo or kendo competition or just, just a match, Shiai, I would lose immediately. So it just gave me perspective. Made me, I, I hope it made me better at doing Aikido. But not only doing, made me better uh, as a partner. Uh, when I'm taking Ukemi, when I'm just, hand- I'm giving something to, to the guy practicing, actually practicing the technique. And I, I completely lost this idea of being in uh, opposition competition against trying to stop, prevent someone from doing the technique. Um, if you want to learn something, you have to be able to do it, even if it's the wrong way. At some point, you need to uh, progress by doing it, be it wrong. And your opponent's well, main duty is to uh, make it the hardest possible without making it impossible which is very difficult, actually. It's probably the the curse of Aikido, because you need someone in front of you that is willing to give you everything and, and in a very smart way. And if you don't have a partner like that, you cannot practice and you cannot get better. And that, that's very difficult. With competition, it's much easier to learn. Um, and judo and kendo gave me that. So I, I'm very grateful for the time I, I had in judo and kendo. And I think I might do some karate or, or kendo again. Not judo because I don't like it. But, uh, uh, karate or kendo again, very likely in the next few years. Movies. I wonder if you have a different viewpoint of movies as an Aikido practitioner or, or as a martial artist living in Japan. You know, here we're... In the U.S., of course, we're, we're all about the big, dramatic, flashy martial arts films. Do you watch those, or are those something you enjoy, or do you see things differently? Yeah, yeah I do. And <laughs> actually, I'm not sure um, people listening will be very happy with my answer. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you cut or, or not, but if you, <laughs> you want to cut it, you can. <laughs> um, well... <clears throat> I I love Jackie Chan movies because uh, he gathers the best of Hong Kong action movies and um, and it's very nice um, funny guy. He's not trying to show impossible things. He's not cheating. He's cheating, but he's saying he's cheating. So it's just for fun, and I like that. But if I have to give an opinion seriously about martial art movies, um, I really, I can't stand all those movies uh, that, in addition to being completely disconnected to the reality, take them super seriously. No way. 
uh, it, it's like pornography and sex in real life. Uh, the, the, the same thing, right? Mm. Uh, it's the same thing with martial art movies. Uh, like, if I have to mention one Aikido martial art actor guy, uh, I would say Steven Seagal. Uh, he does martial arts pornography. There, I'm sure there are plenty of good movies um, that I haven't seen, or some of them I did, and I did like some of them, of course. But um, but no, it's so much disconnected from reality. I think it's very good. Um, it's good move, action movies for people who don't practice martial arts. Uh, like like when you like watch Expendable, you're not necessarily someone shooting people all day. You just want to see people shooting for fun. And if you ask a Marines or, or any military guy how serious that is, they will just laugh at it and say, well, it's just funny. But it's the same thing with, with martial art movies. And it's the exact reason why I like, I love Jackie Chan. Because as a martial artist, he used these movies to um, entertain people while trying to teach life lessons uh, without taking himself seriously. And I wish that more preeminent, highly ranked martial, artist, martial artists would behave the same way in their own field. Uh, because Somehow, it's not only actors that take themselves too seriously. It's also teachers. And I think it would be for the benefits of martial arts if, uh, if more teachers would take example um, from Jackie Chan, uh, not in what he does technically, but in how he does it. I don't know if you see the point, but uh, yeah, okay. I, I'm not a I'm not a big fan of martial action movies. How about books? Martial arts books are are they? Do you spend time with those? You mentioned some some research and I believe some translation earlier on. Yeah. So when it comes to books, um, I'm mainly on the research field meaning that um, I don't read whatever sensei, whatever teacher wrote, because, because actually my, my point would be to read what he read and have my own interpretation of it. So I'm not reading that kind of books. But um, I think that if you practice Japanese martial arts, like at least Japanese martial arts, there are two books you absolutely need to read. Um, the first one is uh, uh, Bushido and the Art of Living. It's by Alexander Bennett that I mentioned before. Um, so the title is a bit misleading, but because it's not about the art of living your life today and, and improving yourself. Um, it's, it's an inquiry uh, the, the point is to unfold the history of what can be called Bushido from the earliest time of Japan. Two or days, of course. It, it goes almost to present days. Um, but there is an emphasis on how it evolved to stay relevant to its time. Um, I mean, Bushido, what, what we all think Bushido is, is like of a very um, uh, foggy concept. We, we don't really know what it is. We know that there are some values and, and everything, but we, we don't really know what it is. And it's actually not uh, a fixed concept. It did evolve uh, over time to stay relevant to, the, to its own time. And that's exactly what this book is about. Um, what it was five, six hundred years ago, what it was two hundred years ago, one hundred years ago, fifty years ago, ten years ago. And I, I really recommend this book because unless you have a clear understanding of Japanese history, you cannot really benefit from uh, 
Musashi is scoring the show, the the three to five rings, the five, five rings book of the Hagakure, uh, which are the most written on Japanese martial art books. Um, because it's very obscure, you really cannot understand that if you don't have a, a huge uh, Japanese history and culture background. Um, honestly, unless you went to university studying Japanese and Japanese culture, don't read the Gorin no Sho, the Hagakure right away and think you, you, you understand everything because you, you don't, you really don't. And um, the Musashi's life is crazy. In martial arts today, we, we talk about um, fair fights and values and everything. Musashi is just saying that if you cannot win a fight, you just should use tricks and wait the guy turn the back and, and stab him in the back, which is absolutely completely against what we what, what martial arts stands for today. But that, that's clearly written in the Godino Show. So you can read it and ignore it, but it, it's in the book. And what Bennett is doing in his own Bushido history book is unfolding the world history and how the values of Bushido by Musashi were useful and relevant in his time to stay alive and how the same set of values can be changed, uh, romantized in some ways, uh, to be relevant to all days today. So I, I think it's an amazing book with really good references. So when you finish the book, you can just pick up the references and read another one. Um, that would be my first recommendation. If you practice Japanese martial arts, I wouldn't know about Chinese or, or other kind of arts. And maybe if you, after reading this one, or if you uh, have an extensive background in, in Japanese history, you can read the Bushido. It's just called Bushido. And it's written by Inazo Nitobe. It was written during the early Meiji period, so more than 100 years ago. Uh, and what's very interesting is that Nitobe was a scholar, an educator. He was raised Christian. He spent quite a while in the West. He, he had no connection whatsoever with Bushido and samurai culture. Uh, he did write his book directly in English. At the time, Japanese, Japan was just opening to the, the foreign world, and his vision of Bushido was romanized, idealized, uh, written with the aim of presenting the best of Japanese cultures to, to the West, uh, with absolutely no regards to truth. It's it's, but it's not complete nonsense. That's what's interesting. It's because it shows exactly what was the Japanese mindset of the Meiji period, exactly the time of the last samurai movie. If you if you like the last samurai movie, you should read Bushido, the, the book of Nitobe, because it's it explains what Japanese people thought of themselves of one or how they wanted to sell themselves to the West at the time. And that's exactly what the last samurai movie is doing. It's rewriting the Nitobe's book. It's selling to the West what Japan wanted to sell at the time, which is completely off reality. But it's still very interesting, historically speaking, because if you can understand the gap between this movie or this book uh, and the truth of the time, then you perfectly understand the, the gap there is um, in the Japanese society today, because it's exactly the same, the same kind of, of thing you find in the Japanese society today. Anyway, I don't know if that's what your uh, audience is waiting for, hoping for, but, um, but that's my recommendation. Yeah, no, no, those are great choices, and they're, they're great because I don't believe either of them has been recommended on the show before. We appreciate that, of course. If anyone's new to the show, 
whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is where you can go for all of the show notes, where we have links to and, and mention the books and anything else that, that's been discussed on the show and links to past episodes that are referenced, such as Sensei Arar's episode and, and other things that we are yet to talk about. Let's talk about the future. We've spent a lot of time talking about the past and how you've gotten to where you are now, but let's look forward. What are your goals? What what are you – obviously, you're still training. You still enjoy training, and you enjoy training so much that you brought that passion into your professional life. What are you looking to accomplish as life moves forward? Do you trust me if I, if I tell you I have no goal at all? Um, I think I'm getting better every day, just working, training, and, and meeting people. Uh, I I don't know if I'm getting better. I'm not the the one to say it, but uh, I'm trying. At least I'm trying. And every good time, every hard time, every training session, uh, it's like one more one small setup at a time. I'm learning. And um, and I think Budo is a lifelong process that only ends with death. Uh, and my only goal is to continue improving myself. So I, I really don't have specific goal. I, I'm not a teacher. I don't want more students. Um, with my company, I don't want more customers. I, I, I don't care about more money or more customers. I just want to do things the, the best way I can and uh, do do better every day. I wake up in the morning with new ideas for the website, for uh, for the company, for my staff, for, for, for training. Uh, sometimes I have a small dojo at home, and sometimes I I sit in, in the middle of the dojo, um, not really meditating because I, I I never probably managed to get into that. I tried, but never uh, never could do it. But I'm just sitting in the middle of the dojo, and I think. Yeah, I should do that that way. I should at least I should try and see what comes out. And I think that's very funny. That that's that's happiness for me. Um, having new ideas and being able to test or implement them, be, be it at work or, or in the dojo and the mats and, and no matter what, it's it's just enough for me. Let's talk about you and what you've got going on now. This is your chance to talk about your company that you've withheld the name all of this time. Talk to us about that. If people want to reach you, find you online, this is your commercial time, as we call it. Well, I'm, I'm from scientific background, and I did Japanese studies, so I'm not very good at selling my, myself. <laughs> I don't know marketing or stuff like that. Um, uh, I, I think I've been very lucky uh, to have such a successful company. Uh, I, I hope it's just because I'm doing my job the right way. But uh, I, I have to admit that uh, sometimes I think I'm just lucky. Uh, so the company is called Seido, S-E-I-D-O. It's um, in Japanese. Uh, it's a kanji, the Japanese letter for a uh, star. Hoshi, and uh, the letter for Do, like in Karate Do, Judo, Karate Do, so the, the way. And um, it's called the way of the star for uh, many reasons, but mainly because I find that very poetic. And I, I think some company used the, the character uh, Bu, which is the uh, war, or, or like in Bushido or Budo. Uh, I didn't want to use it because uh, it reminds more of the martial part of martial arts. And my whole life has been about the way. And I want more, I want to focus on the way more than on the technique and the fighting. So that's why I, I prefer this Do uh, character for, for the company name. Um, so we're selling 100% made in Japan items, uh, mainly uh, wooden weapons, um, clothing, and uh, a, a few Iaito, so it's the, the 
Japanese word replica, uh, which are in aluminium alloy. It doesn't cut and it will never cut. Uh, I want to, to uh, emphasis on that because many people think that Yato should be uh, made of steel and, and it's just not possible legally in Japan. Uh, the only way to make a steel blade is to be an approved craftsman from the Japanese government and your blade is going to cost five to ten thousand dollars. So it's just not possible to create an imitation that would be made of steel. And 100% of Japanese teachers and Iaido students are using alloy blades. Uh, I, I don't say it's perfect, but it's the Japanese way and the Japanese law. So we, we're selling a few of those as well. Um, if you, you want to have a look of, at you, our YouTube channel, uh, probably Jeremy is going to put that in the, the, the website. Absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, we, we have a video about uh, Minosaka, the, the workshop we was working with for EATOS. It's about, I don't know, 15 minutes long, maybe, where we present the workshop and the craftsman and everything. We're very proud of the video because um, the music and the editing is done by Guillaume Ra, again, him, uh, <laughs> because he's a very good uh, artist when it comes to video editing and, and music. Uh, the shooting, the interview, directing, everything I, I did myself. Uh, and very proud of the video because I think it could be aired on like National Geographic and no one would realize that it's not a professional production. We did a crazy job. That's the only one we have with that level of production, but <laughs> I'm very proud of it. And I hope we will have more, but it's, it took a year to have the, this video live, so <laughs> it's a bit too much of work. I'm sorry. Um, well, we we're, we're selling 100% uh, made in Japan equipment. Almost, I would say 100%, because there are a few things like raw materials that are coming from China, like uh, laser imitation uh, is not produced in Japan anymore, so we have to import that, as well as the ebony wood for Boken, because obviously ebony is from Africa, so we cannot have it in Japan. Right. But apart from the few items that are, for good reasons, uh, not 100% made in Japan, all other items are uh, fully made in Japan. And um, well, I, I, I think we're helping the community. We, we're releasing documentaries and interviews. We're supporting people, uh, helping them with translations, uh, proofreading. Um, fact checking or simply with money we're just sponsoring a, a few events and a few people with their research um, so buying from us is in a way uh, also supporting the, the martial art community so I, I won't lie we are mainly focused on Aikido equipment Iaido equipment which is our second market if i can say that this way and uh, a bit of yeah uh, a bit of kendo and but we chose to not sell a few items like kendo armors because kendo armors bogu in japanese are 99.9 um, percent made in china Sometimes finished in Japan and labeled label as made, made in Japan, but they're not. And um, it's a very complicated market. We don't know where the products and raw material come from, so we do not sell them. That's as simple as that. It's a very good example. Because if we don't know a product, if we cannot master the product, not 100% because we're not craftsmen, we're not going to do as good as people making them, but if we can understand um, at least much better than any of our competitor would do the how the products are made, why, and where they come from, then we just don't sell them. So if you come on a website and decide to, to make a purchase with us, um, you can be sure that we know what you're selling, uh, we love what we're selling, 
um, we do work on some items very extensively, like wooden weapons. Uh, we're the only company offering the choice between uh, varnished or oil polished weapons. So you, you can choose which finish you want for almost all the weapons we have on the website. And we do make the oil polish directly at our shop, meaning we resend the weapon with very, very thin sandpaper and we put oil on them like for three, four days. Uh, so they have a touch that is amazingly smooth. But this is honestly it's not for you. It's just because we like it. Because we working with wood and then those wonderful products, it's just something we, we like we love to do. So um yeah, if you're really interested in the best of the best for your practice in Aikido, Yeido, Kendo, or Koryu, like Katori Shinto you or, or uh, any Kenjutsu Koryu, um, or if you are interested in craftsmanship and you want to see what Japanese craftsmen are producing, then please have a look to the website and see what we do. Uh, if you do so, make sure to, to, to click on the About Us page and then the Craftsman Presentation page, because I think that's the two most important pages on the website, um, presenting the team and our motivations, and who is who, and also the Craftsman Presentation, who is who, what they do, their pictures. Uh, we, we're going to come up with uh, interviews of Almost, unfortunately, almost all the wooden weapon craftsmen in Japan. There is one who did refuse the interview, but uh, the three others did accept. So the first one is planned in a week or two from now on our YouTube channel. The second one in a month and the third one a month after. And yeah, if, if you want to hear about uh, um, what Japanese craftsmen in a Finnish world with issues with uh, raw material uh, sourcing and um, and Japanese very old society, so not so many young people uh, doing the art, um, what they think of what they're doing, their uh, good and bad points. Uh, I think you should have a look to the, the the interviews we are currently working on, because uh, I I don't know if I'm proud of the final result because it's not live yet, but I am very um, personally myself. I'm I'm very happy of the time I had with the scriptman, what they told us, the relationship we have. Um, <clears throat> we I think Sado is a company that probably took like the second place, not the first one, but the second place uh, in the Aikido and Koryu martial art equipment market in like five years, when other companies have like between 25 and 100 years of background. And I think if we manage to do that, it's also because we also managed to get a better relationship with the craftsman in five years that all other companies did in 100 years. Uh, it's not a, only about customers, it's about everything. It's about the human side of things and, and getting along with people, understanding what they do. Um, next, next summer, I'm bringing one of my staff with me in the south of Japan, visiting the, the scrapman again. And we've planned a week there, uh, learning how to uh, finish and fix weapons. Um, and this was an idea, we had it within the company for a few years, but it was actually a proposal for the craftsmen themselves. They just said, oh, you're fixing weapons, you're trying to, to improve weapons with all finish and everything. You should spend a week here and, and learn technique with us. And I dare any any other competitor, any other martial artist who would have visited us with them in the past uh, to say the same thing. I, I really think we have this amazing human relationship and then 
I don't want to say I'm proud about, about it because I just feel it natural, but I'm very happy about it. Speaking as someone who spends a lot of time working with manufacturers and making sure things are done properly, I can hear the passion for what you do in what you're saying. And, and I do hope that folks will check out everything that you've got going on at Sado at the website. And again, we will link all of these things that we've talked about, links to the website, social media, etc. at our show notes page, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for being so open and sharing everything that you did. And I'm hoping I could ask you for one more thing. Send us out in our signature way. What parting words do you have for the folks listening today? I'm sorry. Just cut in the middle of your phrase. Oh. In the middle of your sentence. Yeah. Okay. What parting words, what advice would you give to the people listening? <clears throat> Should I give any advice? Um, you don't get that. Um, I'm drinking, I'm smoking. Um, I, I'm far from perfect. Um, oh, many teachers, many very famous teachers do smoke and drink as well in Japan. But um, as a foreigner, I shouldn't. I should know better. I should do better. Um, but I'm not, I, I'm not ashamed uh, of that. I, I'm just a human being. Um, so, the, the the only advice I can give is about what makes me happy. Um, I want to quit cigarette and I uh, I want to reduce drinking. So I, you shouldn't smoke. That's the first advice, uh, and don't drink too much. But that's just a, a human speaking advice. It's, it's not martial arts related. Um, no, if we talk about martial arts, um, I say learn. Uh, just learn as much as you can. No matter how good you think you are uh, or cultivated you think you are, uh, you can always get better. Uh, I, I've i done a few things. Many people say, uh, oh, it's amazing. Oh, you created an amazing company. I really don't see that as amazing. I see that just as a natural process because I'm learning every day and just trying to do things better. So I think that would be the best advice. Um, Budo is a framework. It's not a religion. In a religion, you have everything you need inside it. In the framework, you decide what you put inside it. So you could put religion inside the Budo framework if, if you want to. That That's something possible. But you can put anything else. It's just up to you. Uh, it, it's up to you to make the best of everything you do, of everything, of all your experiences, uh, and to build inside this framework. So put it whatever you want and, and just try to learn and do better every day. Uh, where you come from, where you're going, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what it brings to your life every day your practice, Buddha, what it brings to your life every day. If you feel it gives you something, brings you something that uh, makes your life better, makes your ethic and moral better, then you have it and you should stick to it and just look for anything that make, make, can make it even better. And if it doesn't, then maybe you should stop and try something else. Because there is no point in doing something you, you don't like or you, you can have fun with or, or which is not um, improving your way of life. So, yeah, just be sure of the reasons why you're practicing. Try to learn as much as you can and, and have fun. Just have fun. Mr. Delage was nothing short of magnificent, and I want to thank him. Despite some troubles that we had with Skype, I thought the conversation came out pretty good. His journey in the martial arts is inspiring. And it's from being, you know, challenged as a child to starting Sado, all the great stuff in between. He's proved to us that martial arts is his life. Thank you, Mr. Delage, for coming on the show. If you want to check out the show notes with photos, links, and everything else that we talked about in this episode, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. 
We also, of course, have links to Sato and the things going on in Mr. Delage's life. If you want to follow us on social media, we are at Whistlekick, and you can find all of our products at whistlekick.com. I want to thank you for sharing your time with me today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.